Good evening, everyone, and thank you all for coming. Um, my name is Nikki Reich, and on behalf of the Center for Human Rights and Global Justice and the Bernstein Institute for Human Rights, it's my pleasure, my great pleasure, to welcome you this evening to tonight's panel discussion on the Black Lives Matter movement, racial inequality, and human rights in the United States. Before diving into the substance, I want to thank those who've helped make this evening possible, including the faculty co-directors of the center, Meg Satterthwaite, Philip Alston, Sally Mary, who are here tonight, Tina DeStruper, the managing director, and Audrey Watney, the assistant manager of the center here at NYU, um, and also the NYU Law Communications a team and AV people who are very helpful. Um, we sincerely regret the scheduling conflicts with uh, the Yom Kippur holiday this evening, and it's for that reason also to enable all those who aren't able to be here to watch this important discussion and to engage that we're videotaping it. So please be aware that the event is being recorded, um, and we'll make it available online as soon as possible. Um, so this evening's event is part of an initiative at the Center for Human Rights and Global Justice that seeks to promote research, debate, and advocacy on the relationship between inequality, the global economy, and human rights. The purpose of tonight's event is to engage in an ongoing conversation that's occurring outside these walls, and which needs to occur more often inside these walls, about race, inequality, violence, and injustice, which are among the principal human rights issues of our time. As many of you know, the hashtag Black Lives Matter was created by three black women in 2013, following Trayvon Martin's murder in Florida, as a challenge to anti-black oppression and a call to action. Over the past year, since Mike Brown's killing at the hands of a police officer in Ferguson, Missouri, the movement for black lives has gained momentum and public profile. The mobilization against anti-black racism and police violence has been fueled by more deaths of black people, men, women, children, straight, queer, trans, at the hands of police officers in 2014 and 2015. Their names far too many to mention here. While media attention has focused on individual incidents of police violence, organizers and activists remind us that the movement for black lives stands for more than a challenge to extrajudicial killings of black people by the police. It also stand, stands for a challenge to the multiple ways in which black people are deprived of fundamental rights and dignity in the United States. State violence against black Americans is by no means a new phenomenon, nor is police violence the sole manifestation of structural discrimination against black people and the marginalization of black communities. Increasingly, these problems are being framed not just as civil rights issues, but as human rights issues. This framing has emerged in part out of frustration with the limits of the legal system here in the United States and the frequent failure of existing civil rights laws and enforcement mechanisms to guarantee accountability and prevent further violations. Recourse to the universal language of human rights is also born of a desire to connect the problems of oppression here with those experienced by other communities around the world and throughout history. The aim of the panel tonight is to spark a critical debate about the relevance of international human rights, its law, principles, institutions, discourse, to the struggle for racial justice here in the United States, and specifically to the movement for black lives. In a country where the international human rights regime is largely seen as a set of precatory principles, a moral framework, not as much as a legal one, and where people more often think in terms of civil rights than human rights, many may ask, what is the value of framing this struggle as a human rights struggle? How has human rights framing or recourse to international human rights bodies benefited, or how could it benefit efforts to address anti-black police violence or structural discrimination and the marginalization of communities of color? What are the strategic and practical downsides, if any, perhaps, to framing these issues in human rights terms? To help guide our discussion of these questions tonight, we have with us a really spectacular panel of leaders, lawyers, advocates, and activists who are experts in human rights and racial justice in the United States. I won't dare to provide their full bios, because if I did, there would be little, left, uh, little time left to uh, have a panel discussion. But um, briefly, I will introduce the panelists and then turn it over to Philip Alston, who will be moderating this evening. So Philip Alston, at my far right, in addition to being a full-time member of the faculty here at the law school and the faculty director of the Center for Human Rights and Global Justice, is currently the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights. Previously, as the UN Special Rapporteur on Extrajudicial Executions, he conducted numerous fact-finding missions that examined state violence and police killings around the world. To his immediate left is Steve Hawkins, the executive director of Amnesty International USA and an alumnus of this law school, I should mention. Prior to joining Amnesty, Steve was the Executive Vice President and Chief Program Officer at the NAACP, having been an attorney with the NAACP Legal Defense Fund earlier in his career. 
He also previously served as the executive director of the National Coalition to Abolish the Death Penalty and has held numerous other leadership positions. Uh, to the left of Steve is um, Gay McDougall, who has a long career in international human rights institutions. She is currently a member of the United Nations Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. She served as the first UN uh, independent expert on minority issues from 2005 to 2011 and was the executive director of the international NGO Global Rights from 1994 to 2006. She's also worked extensively on the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa and the transition to a democratic government there, including as a member of a South African governmental body established um, to administer the, and set up the non-racial elections in 1994. To her left is Tenjiwe McHarris, an activist organizer and the co-founder of Blackbird, a group that supports activism against police violence and racism in communities across the country. She was formerly the director of the Human Rights at Home campaign at the US Human Rights Network. And Tenjiwe has worked for and helped lead many human rights and social justice organizations committed to addressing policies and practices that perpetuate structural violence and institutional discrimination, including past stints at Amnesty International, among elsewhere. Um, to her left, Mina Jagannath is a co-founder and lawyer with the Community Justice Project in Miami. Before joining the Community Justice Project, she worked for the Bureau des Avocats Internationaux in Port-au-Prince, Haiti, where she coordinated the Rape Accountability and Prevention Project. She's been extensively involved in efforts to bring issues of discriminatory police violence in the United States before international human rights bodies, and I'm sure we'll hear more about that tonight. Last but definitely not least, uh, to my immediate right, is Vince Warren, who is the, uh, the executive director of the Center for Constitutional Rights. Prior to his tenure at CCR, he was a senior staff attorney with the American Civil Liberties Union, where he litigated civil rights cases focusing on affirmative action, racial profiling, and criminal justice reform. He was also involved in um, a theme here on the panel tonight in monitoring South Africa's historic Truth and Reconciliation Commission hearings and has worked as a criminal defense attorney at the Legal Aid Society. So without further ado, um, and without doing due justice to all of uh, tonight's speakers' uh, illustrious careers, I will pass it over to Philip and, and please join me in welcoming all of our panelists. Uh, well, thank you, Nikki. Um, you've located everyone. They're all well to the left of me. Um, I do want to take the opportunity to thank Nikki for all the work that she's done to put this together. Uh, and I think it's uh, been a, a fantastic, um, fantastic endeavor. It's a wonderful group, and I look forward to the discussion tonight. Um, as Nikki said, uh, the only justification really for me to be here is that I did work for six years on these very issues at the international level in terms of trying to persuade a lot of groups in different countries that police killings in their state uh, could be assisted in some way by drawing international attention to them. The big issue tonight, though, of course, is whether the US is different. Uh, I'd like to begin with a very brief interview of an American international law professor, uh, sorry, international, sorry, constitutional law professor uh, to ask her what she thinks of this. And the answer would be very simple. The answer is, look, stupid Australian, you don't understand. We have an incredibly robust uh, legal system here. We have a very robust media that draws attention to everything. We have a long history of exceptionalism. We are impervious to international criticism. Uh, this is not going to make a difference. It's going to be a distraction. Uh, it's going to waste resources and no one in this country is really going to listen. The other side of it, uh, the side that I was coming from in my UN capacity is, look, every country has a response somewhat along those lines. Uh, Gay McDougall, a very popular hate figure in Australia. <laughs> Gay challenged the Australian government very strongly when she was previously a member of the Committee on Racial Discrimination. Um, she really was sort of vilified, this, who's this stupid American woman who's asking all these ridiculous questions? Doesn't she know we're a democracy and we're uh, quite capable of dealing with these issues about Australian Aboriginals on our own? Uh, but it makes a very big difference. Uh, the more abuse there is, it means the more uh, the target has been hit. Uh, one can say that the US is not in fact oblivious on a lot of issues, 
Uh, I could go through them, but I won't. Uh, international comparisons are relevant. Justice Breyer's recent book um, making that argument. International standards in this area are potentially significantly stronger than those that prevail uh, within the United States. Uh, foreign actors are capable of raising the stakes. And just one, I don't want to get off on the analogy, but I do want to at least make the point. Uh, the last major campaign uh, that I ran against the United States uh, was on targeted killings by drones. And that was a very major issue at a time when some of the big domestic NGOs were rather ambivalent about whether they really wanted to get into it. If you look at the track record that I achieved, it was zero. In other words, long report, constant haranguing and so on, and the US in the Human Rights Council said, we'd like to thank Professor Alston for his very interesting report. We'll waste no time in considering it. Um, but if you then look at the reality, uh, in fact, the various agencies of the US government, the CIA, the Defense Department, State and others, spend an awful lot of time uh, going over this analysis, uh, working out how they could respond to it in all sorts of different ways. And today, you have a lot of military people who are complaining these damn NGOs combined with the UN and so on have made it very much harder for us to use drones in the way that we would really like to do it. So I think the bottom line there is you're not going to ever get the formal responses. You know, the UN says the US should stop killing black people. Uh, US says, oh, okay, we'll change all of our policies and practices. That ain't going to happen. But the discussion tonight then is what difference does it make? Uh, should we be putting more emphasis on that or is it something of a distraction? I think the starting point is to get a, a sense of where we are at present. In other words, how significant is the international component? And I'd be very happy for you to be blunt and say, look, really marginal, but not, I'm not disinterested, if that's the bottom line. Uh, maybe we should um, start with Vince looking at particularly the lit litigation context. Are international standards of any relevance in that setting? or in your other work in CIRR? Uh, yes, hi everyone, um, and thanks for the, for the question, Philip. Um, I would also note that um, my organization, CCR, also filed the drones litigation with the ACLU, right. so we were not one of those organizations that uh, waited to see how it was gonna turn out, although we lost quite spectacularly. Um, but um, I think the, the answer is that as from a litigation perspective, um, the international standards can be exceedingly useful, um, and probably not in a direct cause and effect way with the um, with 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 the state. And so, and examples of how it could be useful is that uh, we've used international standards um, incessantly for the last 15 years uh, with our uh, clients in Guantanamo, um, and that's largely because the. Um, back in 2002, when the fir men first came to Guantanamo, um, the U.S. government uh, went to great lengths to carve out legal exceptions and to create, actually create a legal vacuum. There was, a, there was literally no law that would touch the men in Guantanamo. And so um, bringing forth the international standards, and particularly um, even at the Supreme Court level, became very, very important uh, for the Supreme Court to tell the U.S. government that there is some measure of responsibility and accountability that you have uh, under the laws of wars, under under the Geneva Conventions, and otherwise. Um, another example, uh, just a counter example of how international standards don't necessarily help um, in, in in litigation is that is in the in the case that uh, we just got a great settlement on in California, um, sort of ending in some measure solitary confinement in California. Um, one of the experts on our um, case was Juan Mendez, who's a special rapporteur on, on torture, who wrote a uh, fantastic piece and has uh, uh, very much like all special rapporteurs gone around the world and can provide a very unique aspect of how this practice plays out internationally. And so as, as everyone knows by now that uh, the finding from the UN special rapporteur was that after about 15 days in solitary confinement, uh, the effects on the individual um, are either tantamount to torture or are uh, related to torture in some particular way. And our litigation we were filing 
a challenge uh, to solitary confinement based upon uh, the Eighth Amendment cruel and unusual punishment. And so the interesting question was, could we convince a US federal court that the line that should be drawn around prolonged so, uh, solitary confinement is 15 days uh, for the purposes of a constitutional analysis? And the answer, of course, is no, heck no. That would never work in a million years. But that doesn't mean that it, w it didn't add tremendous value because if you begin to look at uh, the media pieces, nobody but you guys really follow the litigation, but when you begin to look at how people feel about it and the effects that it's having, people are talking more casually about solitary confinement as a torturous act um, and I'm wondering why we even do it, particularly when it doesn't make sense. And that's a real value. So there, I mean, those are two examples, one where you can actually apply these things to the courts, and another one is where you apply public pressure outside of the courts when um, you're sort of locked into a constitutional analysis. Okay, it's great to have those two examples because obviously the response to Guantanamo is that's inherently international, uh, but clearly when you're looking at solitary, that is a, an issue that's much more analogous to what we're concerned with tonight. Um, Mina, in terms of community activism, uh, if someone at the local level says to you in Florida, um, are you in favor of UN standards? Do you say, no, 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 nothing to do with them? Uh, well, no. Uh, but, uh, you know, I actually was smiling to myself when you were asking this question because just within the last two days, um, I have had to reflect on my own cynicism around using international law because we, uh, you know, the, as you said, the immediate response is not necessarily one where you see the, the international advocacy producing like immediate fruits, but, but um, just within the last two days, I learned of things that, um, that I had been doing that, that apparently did. So yesterday, um, the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights uh, came to Miami um, on uh, the first day of its tour of the US. Um, to examine specifically um, the issue of police violence against um, black, uh, the black community and then also um, racial discrimination. And so the way that um, structural racism basically also creates inequ uh, inequities in terms of housing, health, and that kind of thing. And uh, when, the, when the commissioner was, um, was explaining what it was that they did, she said that, um, that the start of their inquiry about what was going on in the US in terms of human rights and in terms of racial discrimination started um, at a hearing that we did uh, last year in March, a thematic hearing on stand your ground laws. And uh, you know, at the time, we looked at it as something that was you know, important for the families involved. The, the mother of Trayvon Martin was there, the father of, um, of Jordan Davis was there, and they, they uh, testified and you know, we, we gave our, um, our testimonies, and and you know, in the meantime, the uh, the uh, legislative session in Florida was happening, and they were actually reinforcing stand your ground. They were expanding it. So for us, it felt like okay, that that was a great sort of uh, performative thing, and it, it had its 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 other you know sort of benefits. But but it was difficult for for me to see, while you know, with with the laws kind of with the lawmakers kind of digging their heels in in Florida, you know, what the use was. But, um, but apparently um, with that hearing, the commission started to pay greater attention to, um, to the US as a place where um, human rights abuses are happening um, at a massive scale. And apparently um, after that hearing, that was the first time that the US government met with the commission um, officially. So that's, so, you know, I was like, oh, I didn't even know that that happened. I did not, I didn't know that until yesterday, uh, until the, co the commissioner met, mentioned that. So, so I think, you know, um, as, as you were saying, the, 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 pr the fruits are produced, I guess, much later. And then, uh, and then I also just heard, um, so about an hour ago, the father of um, Israel Hernandez um, called me. And Israel Hernandez, if you don't know, was um, an 18-year-old um, artist who was uh, tased to death by the Miami Beach police in 2013. And um, since then, uh, the police was not charged. He's still in the police force. Um, and, uh, and the family, they went to all levels to, to, to get some justice, but they, but they um, had always, uh, were always met with silence. But um, at, you know, alongside that, the, there was a lot of organizing going on. The Dream Defenders got involved. <coughs> the family itself has been really uh, effective. And, uh, and we actually brought the case to um, the Committee Against Torture, to the CAT review um, in November. 
And uh, at that time, um, when after we filed the report, the Fraternal Order of Police, which is the, the police union, they actually directly submitted a response to our report to the UN committee, basically saying, oh, it wasn't torture or whatever. And, uh, and uh, apparently that's the first time that, that the police have ever really, the, ha have ever really you know, directly interacted with, with submissions there. And, uh, and anyway, so the father, he just called me and he just told me that, um, that they just revised the policy. It's not the most revolutionary policy or anything, but apparently they're not gonna use ta tasers anymore and they are changing their, their use policy. So that's good, I guess, and, 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 and it's, <laughs> It, uh, you know, the sense from both the family and from the people on the ground is that that was directly um, connected to the, the international pressure that they had been uh, receiving and just the, the pressure in the media and, and uh, the, the fact that um, it w it was, they knew that it was a case that was not going to go away. I think we might end the panel on this note. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's, uh, that's terrific. Uh, Tinjiwe, in your work, International Standards? Hi, everybody. Um, so, so I come from the U.S. Human Rights Network um, and now work with an organization called Blackbird. And I'd like to start uh, my answer to that question by, by, with a story, if that's okay. In August of 2014, when the U.S. was being reviewed by the committee, the third committee, the committee that uh, that uh, reviews on racial discrimination, uh, oversees the, the racial discrimination around the world. And when the U.S. was being reviewed on racial discrimination in, in August, I was with the mother of um, uh, the mother of Trayvon Martin, Sabrina Fulton, and the father of uh, Jordan Davis, Ron Davis. And when I was with them, we were preparing um, their speeches, uh, what, they, what we call the interventions uh, at the international level, around what happened to their children. Um, and, and also who their children were, right? And while this was happening, while we were preparing, we heard about Ferguson, Missouri, right? This place in the country that I didn't know about. And here I was with two parents that just uh, were trying to prepare speeches around who their children were and why their children were taken from them. We were having to struggle around the fact that another person, another young person had been killed and that there was a response in Ferguson, there was a resistance and uprising that was happening in response to that, right? And so there was an important question that I had to sit with, and I think that many of us, advocates around the country who had went to Geneva to, uh, to do advocacy work at the international level, had to sit with, which is um, what purpose does international advocacy serve when it comes to um, changing uh, the U.S. To the, so that people uh, particularly pe black people in the U.S. aren't killed um, the way in which they're killed in this country. And um, this, was very, this was very powerful, right? And I think this was powerful not just for me as an advocate, but I think it was powerful for all the other organizers and, and the advocates that were there. And it was actually what inspired me to go to Ferguson when I came back from Geneva. And when I was there, the, the purpose of engaging in conversations that awaken the political imagination enough to demand what it is we deserve as opposed to asking what we think we can get is a conversation about using human rights as a frame as opposed to civil rights as a frame. And so um, I say that all that to say international standards, human rights is important because we are limiting ourselves the, the, as we, if we continue to use civil liberty, civil rights as a frame as we do our work. And so. I carry that in conversations that I have at the grassroots level, and I also carry that in conversations that I have with uh, organizations uh, at the national level. And so that's the long-winded version of saying, yes, it's very important, but there's a lot of work that needs to be done, right? There's a lot of work that needs to be done am uh, amongst people that use um, international human rights law, um, and there's a lot of work that needs to be done to make sure that human rights, um, particularly the kind of human rights that's used by um, grandmothers, family members, impacted people across the country who have been saying that my child deserves quality housing, that has, have been saying that my children deserve to have access to health care, and that all of our community deserves access to the kind of uh, fundamental human rights, right, that we all talk about, that those people are respected as human rights advocates as much as folks that have studied international human rights law. 
Great. Um, thanks. We can come back to some of those issues. Um, Gay, I guess your perspective, having been at the heart of the anti-apartheid movement for a very long time and then very active in the international, is skewed in some way towards assuming that the international um, really matters even in the US? Do you ever question that? Well, I... Yes, I'm, uh, you know, uh, clearly biased in favor of the meaning and the significance of using a human rights framework uh, here as well as in, in, in other countries. Um, you know, my first engagement was with the civil rights movement in this country. And, you know, people don't recall that we used the human rights framework then. Uh, you know, uh, African American struggles have appeal to the international community all the way back to the anti-slavery uh, campaigns. So, you know, if you look at the, the real pictures of the march on the Selma Bridge, you'll see a flag, a UN flag uh, there. Um, so there's always been a sense that at the, at the core of the international community are different standards um, that are more protective um, and uh, more create more opportunities, uh, uh, create forums in which, you know, we can plead uh, new and expanded uh, rights. So, uh, you know, in my view, it's never been um, uh, really an issue, even before I got uh, studied international law and got to the UN. Uh, I think it comes very naturally out of the, um, the movement uh, history uh, of black Americans um, in this country. Uh, it certainly uh, was a big lesson from the anti-apartheid uh, movement. You know, the uh, liberation movements uh, of uh, South Africa were extremely skillful at using and directing the international community to uh, point its laser focus at exactly where it needed in order to move to the next level of struggle. And that's something that I've always, uh, it's what I admired uh, in the anti-apartheid movement, it's something that I have uh, sort of struggled to see if we can replicate uh, here. And that is, you know, not the question of, uh, you know, so much the human rights uh, matter in the US U human rights standards, but how can we uh, see the UN as a forum, an arena for struggle, mm -hmm. for our struggle under our direction. How can we set the targets uh, and the, the tactics and use those forums uh, to move our movements uh, forward? And I think it's uh, something I've always believed. Great. Um, Steve, Amnesty International, um, small organization that some of us have heard of. Um, <laughs> You're obviously international, but Amnesty USA has sort of pioneered the focus domestically uh, among all of the Amnesty sections and so on. To what extent do you um, always insist on international law? If you're talking about police killings, for example, or are you tempted even to go back and say, look at the US Constitution, look at our Bill of Rights and domesticate it? Well, to, re to really uh, pick up uh, and expand a little bit on on where where Gay was was uh, making her points. You know, uh, going back to the very formation of the United Nations, when Walter White and W. E. B. Du Bois pre present the petition to the world, chronicling the the, the lynching of black men, uh, and presenting this document at the San Francisco conference uh, at the very formation of the UN and then being beaten back by Eleanor Roosevelt heading the delegation to appease the Southern Senators. For those of you all who have not read the book, Eyes Off the Prize, it really chronicles this, uh, this, th this history. So in some ways, human rights, um, in terms of black struggle, um, was cleaved and cleaved very deliberately. Um, and human rights uh, went to live more in the academy in the United States, very different from what Amnesty sees around the world. So when I'm with, you know, uh, in rural Mexico, you know, the, you know, the mothers of the disappeared are coming up with their signs, humanos derechos, 
um, but that doesn't happen here. Here, human rights uh, gets talked about in law schools, um, but not in organizing schools. And and amnesty as a model, you know, try uh, work to bring um, uh, human rights into ordinary communities to train average citizens that they could that uh, they could speak out on behalf of um, uh, oppressive re regimes and speak out on behalf of prisoners of, of conscience and did that successfully. I, I think the where we are now touches on what Tan Tan Jiwe was saying. How do you, you know, how do you bring this to the ground, right? And when uh, I, I took a delegation into Ferguson uh, uh, days after Mike Brown was was, was killed, and uh, for those people on the street, you know, they were like, "Well, who are you all with your yellow T-shirts on?" <laughs> You know, and we were there to say, and to say that we were amnesty and introducing people that never heard of amnesty, and to say that uh, that we were there to make sure that the world understood what was happening. So human rights, at the end of the day, is about the right to be human, and uh, and as our, and as the reaction in Ferguson yes. to to you saying that we're here to tell the world about this was that was there any resistance? Not at all, be, because here were people who felt. Um, who felt that they were invisible to, to, uh, to society, and and uh, and and so it it was welcome. Um, the the where where we are now is, is is how to continue to build on on the efforts there, and how to again I I love the example that Tim Jiwei gave of of people giving interventions in. Uh, at Geneva, because so often it's the gray suits that give those interventions, it's the trained lawyers, and that doesn't have to happen. You know, when, when we were uh, working towards ending the juvenile death penalty here in, here in the U.S., uh, in the late 90s, uh, going to uh, a series of the um, me meetings of the U.N. Human Rights Commission at the time, uh, my, my main organizer on the ground there was 24 year old you know University of South Carolina graduate uh, you know but but her gift was she was a tremendously good organizer so she just worked the worked the whole crowd that hangs out in the in the uh, in the cafe and and just made made, made the rounds to all of the uh, the uh, diplomats so it, it it showed me that you do not have to have an NYU law degree or a Harvard law degree or, or you know, be able to quote the second optional protocol to make a difference. And that is, to me, where our real challenge is now in terms of how we um, make human rights relevant um, in the United States, and that is how do, we, how do we arm and give agency to impacted communities so that they can speak out and uh, and use use the um, use the mechanisms of human rights, but also be able to um, to really use it in, a, in terms of I think as Tan Tan Jiwei said, aim higher in terms of what's expected, aim beyond, frankly, the limitations of the U.S. Constitution. Right. I, I don't want to go off on a tangent. I, this is really very quick. But you've been quite hurtful tonight about the role of law schools <laughs> and. <laughs> No, this, I'm a graduate. This comment, this, this comment that, right. you know, it's, they've yeah. been, human rights have been bottled up in academia yeah. and so on. What, what's the, is there a gripe there? <laughs> no, but it's, no, but it, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> Were you badly treated uh, at law school? Uh, <laughs> no, I mean, you know, so, so the funny thing about me, you know, I, I, I came out of NYU, you know, I was one of Tom Frank's protégés when, when, when he was alive, and I was going to spend, you know, two years doing, you know, traditional civil rights law, and then I was going to go into academia. But, uh, you know, I worked on the death penalty, and I, and I realized that if I was going to make the changes that I wanted to make, it was to think about how, how to make those, how to make all the arguments that I had learned in law school relevant to the lives of everyday people. Right. And, that's, and that's the challenge that I think we as advocates face. Right. Um, and no matter how, you know, litigation is one tool in the toolbox, CCR uses it quite effectively, but I'm sure Vince would back me up that, that the litigation 
you know, when, when I begin to win cases in the, in the courts in the Deep South, it's when I realize that, that um, if I went into court thinking that, that, uh, what I, that the argument that I had just wrote, you know, that NYU Law School prepared, prepared me to write, was going to win the day, I was foolish. <laughs> <laughs> and that if I was going to win in court, it was how I could organize a community to stand there with, with me. Right. It made the difference. If, okay. if, if I may, I think yeah. that, uh, and, and I uh, follow your th lead and not wanting to take this off on a tangent, but I think the uh, international human rights movement mm. is, uh, is going through a change now. You know, uh, it was very important at one point to focus our attention on seeing that the standards were there and in place and le were legitimized. And that took sort of technical, you know, expertise and approach, and you wanted to make sure that, you know, everything was in line and that uh, uh, it was appreciated at every stage of governance, not just national, but international. But I think we all realize now, we got all these standards on the books, uh, both uh, civil and political and um, uh, economic and social. And now is the time around the world that we've got to switch back to movement building. And, you know, from the, um, if I can say Arab Spring, whatever we think that's moved on to now, but also to more on Mondays in, uh, you know, North Carolina. Now is the point where we've got to have mobilization on the ground to see that these standards are truly implemented. Okay, uh, that's very helpful. I mean, I, I question you just because I think that one qu can still actually reflect on the situation in American law schools by saying, well, you've got people like me who teach international human rights, and that for the most part is about what they do out there, yeah. and you've got my colleagues who teach con law, and that's what we do here, mm -hmm. and we don't really come together still, uh, despite what we're trying to say to the activist community and others, you know, that you really need to, uh, so maybe law schools are, are, are Vince. Yeah, I, I it's, a, it's very important that we're on this on this piece um, because um, everyone on the stage um, feels, and you're, and I think we are all fortunate to have these folks here feel that um, what happens on the ground, what happens with organizers, what happens with movements, um, is the strategic catalyst for the change that needs to happen. And one of the challenges, I, it's been a long time since I've been in law school, but one thing I, I can say is probably still true, is that law school and, and legal teaching can teach you to be an outstanding technician. Like you can understand exactly, well maybe not exactly, but you can understand how to maneuver within a system, how you can um, tie things together, how you can make the strongest arguments, and that work is exceedingly important uh, for supporting social movements. And in fact, for anybody that would say um, that it's not important, it, it's, it's just not true. But it's not the whole thing. The other thing that, that needs to come together with that, in addition to be a good, being a good technician, um, you have to understand strategy and you can't just understand strategy from in the context of the um, of this of the classroom that you have to uh, really be out in the world in some ways and one of the advantages of the advent of more clinics is that it does require folks to be more strategic both in terms of the technical piece and in terms of working with clients and communities and so for those of you who are law students who when you were asked to draft the first complaint or something like that and you threw everything with the kitchen in kitchen sink in and you're like but the second optional protocol actually applies here <laughs> and your professor and your, your, your instructors are like, yeah, but you know, let's think about what the effect is going to be of putting that in on the front end. So we have to make these strategic choices. But what, what is fabulous about um, the movement for black lives, what uh, Black Lives Matter and the moment that we're in now, is that it is, it is a total revisioning, I think, or a rearticulation of a vision of what it means to be a black person that does not live in fear. And that rearticulation requires from lawyers a certain amount of vision, which they also don't teach you in law school. Um, and it's not a critique of law school, but it actually is the vision that you get along with experience from being in uh, relation with people who are articulating the problem in a way that you can't solve. So for example, it is easier for us to think about, all of us, any of us in this room could think about a series of policies and practices that, that would make it harder for police officers to kill 
people or black right. people. Right. It is really hard for us to think about um, what is the policy that would keep black people from being killed in the way that they are in this country. It is an entirely different uh, framework, and it's actually one that is precisely not set up for our domestic system. And so I, I, I would just sort of throw this out to, to Gay, because Gay made a wonderful point at the Law for Black Lives conference, which a number of us were involved in, in July, which is the concept that the domestic f legal framework is not the, the problems that we're confronting are much larger than the domestic legal framework can handle. And I'm going to throw it off to, to, to Gay, because I think you really articulated that in a beautiful way. Thank you very much. <laughs> but, I, you know, it, it does let, help me to segue into a point that I think comes out in what you hear from Kenjiwe, et cetera, but we, it's, it needs to be unpacked a little bit. I mean, yes, what is... What's what our, our problems here are much larger than anybody's notion of domestic jurisdiction um, uh, in this country, especially if you accept the framework that only things that are in the uh, law books are laws. And, you know, so that only things that can be litigated in court our laws, our rights. That's a very peculiarly American <laughs> point of view. Um, and one of the things that um, uh, comes out of Tenjiwe's uh, uh, articulation here is not just that, uh, you know, we've got a Black Lives Matter movement, et cetera, and we're not using the word civil rights anymore, we're using the word human rights. The important paradigm shift is that human rights includes economic and social rights, which here in the U.S. are just seen, uh, and certainly on the ground even, are just seen as, at best, aspirations. You know, when the Black Lives Matter movement says, let's talk about human rights, they're saying that this whole paradigm shift means that human needs, housing, food, clothing, uh, education, all should be considered public goods that accrue to all of us because we're human. And that government, the job of government, is to make sure that our basic human needs are met. Uh, that's a transformative thought in the U.S. context. So don't, don't just slide over that. That's, that's the biggie <laughs> right there. So is there any, uh, particularly focused uh, on, on Tenjiwe and Mina, is there any pushback against that? Uh, I mean, you've got this raving socialist in our midst who's just made this uh, call to, uh, to I'm broaden. I'm not denying the charge. <laughs> I just <laughs> Um, and what I'm concerned about is to stop the killing of black people. And yes, one day I want to change the world, one day I want to change our basic values, I want to change the structures that might generate these problems, but for now I want to deal with this problem. Does that come up? Is there a resistance to broadening out to say that we can't just save the lives of police victims without bringing about this broader structural change that Gay emphasizes? I mean, I, I can start um, answering that. And I also, I love Gay. There's a number <laughs> of things that I've heard from her over the past year that have had such an impact on me. You know, the, it's, all, it's been an internal conversation, right? And when I say internal, I mean folks that are engaging in uh, this moment, this movement around how we talk about violence. And one thing that many times we talk about is we can't just define violence based on police killings. P violence is also when children can't eat. Mm -hmm. Violence is also when a young person doesn't have a home to go to. And so within the movement space, both at the national and the local level, there's always been a conversation about uh, expanding how we talk about violence and also saying that the killing of a young person is just as connected with the, with the lack of housing, a lack of, 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 of employment, a lack of quality health care. It's, it's a structural problem. 
And so it's been an ongoing conversation, how to make sure that the public and the rest of the country and the world know that that's what we're saying. It's very easy to say that these folks, folks on the ground, organizers, are just talking about police officers killing black people. And in particular, this one bad officer that needs to be reprimanded and held accountable um, because he did a bad thing. No, the push from organizers, from movements, from families has always been, it's bigger than an individual officer. It's not a bad apple problem. It's an institutional problem that's supported by a structure that not only allows for the killings of black people, but because of practices, laws, and regulations, encourages the killings of, killings of black people. And so it's been an ongoing conversation, making sure, again, that the public knows that that's how it's being articulated and been articulated, particularly in demands, in policy asks, in visionary demands. But also the US government at the local level and at the federal level will always minimize what's coming out of a movement, what's coming out of a local struggle uh, because it's in its interest. Right. Right. Um, Mina? Um, you know, I think I think it's what's it's what's interesting is that I think that um, there is this understanding of of a broader uh, definition of of the way violence is done to our communities, but I think that um, there is some resistance to the human rights frame, and I think part of that comes from um, you know just a, a deep tradition of civil rights, uh, and that being sort of um, you know in in some ways um, really ingrained into into folks' head as being. Uh, equivalent to racial justice and and not really thinking about economic and social rights as also racial justice issues. And so the human rights frame has been helpful in bringing those two things together. But, you know, interestingly, like in, you know, as I started to do this work, I realized how much work in terms of education uh, and just working with um, grassroots groups and working with people around what human rights means as a frame was was really important because I think people people associate it with standards and with treaties and you know international like the international world and not not with this sort of more like grassroots interpretation of of human rights which is as because I'm a human being I deserve these basic um, you know what what my human dignity demands and so and so now you know what what uh, a lot of the work that I've been doing has been really working with uh, with groups to to um, to say okay if you're working on on housing and you're working on um, on uh, you know education you're working on police brutality we need not say that these are all disparate issues you know they they're all human rights issues and and when you when you look at them under that banner then you can start to to actually also see the the structural links between those things and uh, and so just to to bring it back to a practical thing I mean you know, the ICHR, the Inter-American Commission, uh, came to Miami yesterday, and in organizing a forum for the commission, originally when they first uh, said that they were coming, they said that they were, they were coming to, um, to look at police violence against the black community and, and racial discrimination, but, you know, nothing more than that. And so for us, you know, what, what we try to do strate from a strategic point of view, both for, like, the public education piece, but then also um, to, to sort of tie tie together the, the structural racism with, you know, the, the more overt violence that we see was to make sure that in addition to um, people testifying about um, the, the, their experiences with police brutality and, uh, and, you know, mass incarceration over criminalization was to also have people um, testify as to gentrification and the lack of housing, the school to prison pipeline, um, reproductive health. And, and all these other issues that are all intimately linked um, uh, to uh, to uh, racial justice or, ra or racial injustice, actually, and and can fall under the banner of human rights. Okay, um, so very quickly, because I want to uh, get the audience involved. Um, uh, to uh, Steve and to Vince, um, what we call economic and social rights, how important are they in the frameworks that you? pursue as representatives of two of the most effective uh, organizations in the country. S Steve? Sure. So, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm taken by how, for example, the, the modern labor leader now, uh, his or her job is profoundly different than what it was 30 years ago. So when I look at someone like Dennis Williams of UAW, 
Dennis will be in Germany one week, in Brazil the next week, um, because uh, the, the, the reality of globalization. Um, and if worker struggles are going to um, uh, move forward, it's, it's going to be looking at, at sort of a collective global worker <coughs> identity. I, I see that as a fertile ground for, for future work around economic rights. Um, you know, we're, we, we, we see it in how um, the fair wages um, and, and, and living wage mo movement has, has uh, sprung forth. Um, but I think there's a lot more that could be done there. So, um, you know, the whole realm of economic and social rights, I'm, I'm, I'm very taken by the uh, action in Detroit, for, for example, around the right to water. Um, a lot more that I think can, can be pursued. Finn? deeply important, and I, the way that we approach it at CCR is that most of our litigation and advocacy um, in the courts is around s civil and political rights. But um, that one of, the, one of the things that we've realized is that if you look at, particularly if you're litigating against police departments or immigration and customs enforcement or you know, name a, uh, a, a, an entity, that when you're working with folks on the ground, you, you realize that those are mechanisms, that it's one thing to litigate against a policy, which we do, we, you know, we ended stop and frisk, that's wonderful, but it's another thing to actually try to dismantle the elements and the, um, um, uh, dismantle structural racism. So, if you, another way of thinking about policing is not, you know, not the, you know, Tenji Wei suggested that most people think about this bad cop, good cop, what, bad apple, whatever. Another way to think about it is look at what bad policing or policing of black folks reinforces. And so, you very quickly see that the stop and frisk policy actually reinforces uh, the degradation of social and economic rights almost as a, as a primary objective. So one policy is um, policing and stop and frisks in people in public housing. It is not because that they are looking for uh, people that have committed crimes. They are actually trying to reinforce and to enforce uh, people living and the way that people are controlled within their, within their spaces. If you think about education, uh, yet another uh, right that is not a fundamental right under our US Constitution, stop and frisk in schools and, and policing in schools is about uh, primarily about removing problematic kids from school. And so um, the, the, there is a tremendous link. So even if your primary strategy is through um, civil and political rights, um, the innovation, the, the magic in the moment, and the promise of <coughs> human rights in this moment is about A, making that link to social and economic rights, B, bringing your brains and your technical skills to the aid of people who knew that all along, um, and wondering why you haven't filed the lawsuit that's going to, you know, create uh, jobs and, and, and housing for everybody, and to begin to partner on what is the innovation that we can do as legal uh, folks to be able to partner to think through what are the outcomes that we actually want from housing, and do we need to remove bad policing in this community um, in order to get there. So the last thing I'll say is that if you take a poll, if you ask, if you ask the average white person in, in an urban setting what's the number one problem, they'll say jobs. You ask the b average black person what's the number one problem, they'll say cops. The number 1.1 problem is jobs. And what that tells you is that there's a suggestion of a strategy that you can only really figure out in partnership with the people who are actually there, that at some level there's something to this policing thing that is enforcing, reinforcing um, the social and economic rights people want to get to. Okay, that's great. Um, did you want to add something to that, Tanjiwe? Looking, you're white. Okay. Uh, so uh, ask for questions, keep them brief. Ideally, identify yourself, and if you can, better to target one particular person, unless it's really broad. So, take us. Yeah, in the front row here. Uh, I think. Yeah. Thank you so much for the um, fascinating discussion. Um, as an outsider, um, I, I'm, I'm catching on to something which Vince and Gay have both mentioned um, and just turning uh, the discussion slightly. I hope it doesn't go off the track. But one thing which was stressed by a lot of the speakers was that as a domestic problem, this has far larger implications. Um, and I think one of the implications is what, hap what implications there are abroad. And as an outsider, I always 
think that the movement in the United States are always so significantly referred to what in what is happening elsewhere. So the Roads Must Fall movement in South Africa uh, at the University of Cape Town referred quite significantly to the Black Lives Matter movement. And very recently, um, the movement for a um, new set of reservations for outcasts in, in India, Dalits uh, have referred to uh, the Black Lives Matter movement quite extensively as well. And the same is true for police violence um, in London off late, all instances, the, the advocacy um, of say, South Hall Black Sisters, which is a premier organization's reference to it. So the question is how much do you think uh, US refers back to those references to see what's happening in comparative instances abroad? And the second thing is what happens in comparative law abroad. For example, um, India, South Africa, even Canada, such deep-seated significance of socioeconomic right that it's not challenged. I mean, it's not just about the legal rec recognition or justiceability, but it's just a matter of the moral recognition of these rights being just important. And how relevant does compar comparative law remain for advocacy in the United States? So, one, about comparative instances, and two, about comparative law, whether it's been referred to, and if not, can you hypothesize why it isn't, and what's the resistance? Thank you. You're, you're in an academic institution here. <laughs> 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 um, so, I mean, I think that's great to hear that Black Lives Matter resonates uh, overseas uh, with a lot of these movements. It raises one of the issues that you all touched on earlier on, and that is the question of whether you try to build a bigger international movement, mm -hmm. whether that's really going to help or whether that's not a distraction, but it's just a sort of sideline. I, I, you know, I, I think all of these struggles end up connecting. I mean, mm -hmm. so you know, the efforts around policing in, that were launched here in New York City around zero tolerance, we've seen that in in London, we've seen that in Brazil. Brazil had just the report. So the bad examples go as fast as the good examples. Yeah, uh, the bad examples travel <laughs> quite quite faster, actually. But, uh, but there's an opportunity there. So what I'm struck by is we're not at a point yet um, uh, where um, advocates uh, around criminal justice matters or LGBT issues or, you know, the right to, 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 to fair wa wages are connected globally. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where we have to go. And I'm struck by you know, a young investment banker at 32 years old being trained in any in here in New York. He or she will not only know their counterparts in San Francisco and Chicago, but they'll also be sent to Singapore, they'll be sent to South Korea, they'll be down in Johannesburg. And so the business community is realizing the globalization. Law firms have, 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 have realized that. So how, does, so how do we begin to connect the rights um, and the similar struggles, um, sometimes by the same political operatives that sort of travel around and, 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 and spread po policy? Um, how can we do that kind of comparative networking and realizing um, that, that there's a collection of efforts there may be more emphasis, in fact, on peer-to-peer -peer networking than even the UN and so on. Yeah, but the UN creates a space right. where that can happen more easily. Yeah. Um, and uh, it was uh, easier to do that before the reforms. I won't uh, get inside baseball. But, you know, now what happens is that uh, activists from any one country, U.S., uh, take your pe uh, petition when it's time for the UN to talk about the, the U.S. Go there, drop your petition, have your testimony, come out. That is not as powerful and as meaningful in the sense you're raising as the times when we were all there together um, and, you know, you exchanged uh, with other NGOs, tactics, understandings, what are you doing, et cetera. And the opportunity to form these kinds of international uh, networks uh, was, was there and real. I think it's critically important. And the, the problem I find is that that's what Americans don't, even American NGOs don't think is as important as, you know, it is. Uh, uh, 
silly question. Sorry, I know the question should come from the audience, but have either of you had anything to do with the Rio de Janeiro people? Yes. In other words, huge police killings going on in Rio, a lot of parallels, one would think. And uh, instead of going to the UN and having the generalised thing, you'd think that, you know, a US, um, Brazilian and uh, maybe South African, whatever, uh, grouping would answer some of the challenges that Steve raises. But it's not something that has... Well, well it ha you know, I would be curious to know... Um, you know, the role that social media has now in creating some of mm. these new source or sort of mm. forums. But but on your point, Phil, I mean, I, I was just last week with, with my, with the head of Amnesty in Brazil. We were down at the meeting in New Orleans, which is sort of a gathering of everyone working on, on um, black men and boys initiatives. And uh, we've, and they just released a report on, you know, the 38,000, young people between the ages of 14 and 21 killed by the police in, re in, 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 uh, in Brazil, and then specifically looking at, at a Rio. Uh, so um, he had brought up one of his youth activists. We had some of ours there, and, and, and we're actively thinking about how we collectively work to together. And there's similar efforts around gun violence that, that, mm. that we're lo looking at and how it touches in, in different parts of the world. Okay, great. Um, thank you for your question. Uh, I just want to really touch on even the power of social media. Another reason why I decided to go to St. Louis, and many folks may not know, but some of the first people to um, share with these young folks in Ferguson how to deal with tear gas were Palestinians. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so if you speak to some of these organizers, Ashley Yates, for example, she'll tell you, I can, d I can create a tear gas mask in a few minutes because I learned from someone from a Palestinian person over social media. And so I, so I go to, I say that, and then I say that I believe that we can't win unless we build a global movement, mm -hmm. both for the purposes of learning from each other and exchanging with one another, because as we've seen policing practices all over the world, they're looking more, more and more similar as countries are sharing techniques, uh, personnel, uh, and, 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 uh, and technology, yeah. right? And so as they, as policing, and uh, the uh, response to resistance, as state repression looks more and more similar, it becomes more and more important for social movements to learn and grow with each other. Also because, uh, for the purposes of building power, right? Um, and, then, uh, and then just to go back to Gay's point around international advocacy, it does create opportunities for us to be able to, one, surface our troops, troops at the international level, and be able to build with one another at the international level. And so in May or March of this year, we had a panel during the Human Rights, when the Human Rights Council was in session with someone from Ferguson, as well as someone who had lost their son by an Israeli uh, police officer, right? And so the international, uh, uh, international advocacy opportunities are also opportunities for us to engage in the exercise of building a global movement. Um, yeah. Okay, Amina, did you want to add on that? Yeah, I know that there are other questions in the audience, but I just wanted to say that I think, you know, in addition to the important sort of tactical exchange, which I think, you know, me, with my background as an international lawyer, it's interesting because the way that I analyze also what to do tactically here in the U.S. is very much so influenced by seeing movements abroad, and, it's, and it allows you to sort of disrupt, to use a buzzword, <laughs> some of <laughs> creative disruption um, of what, uh, you know, seem to be pretty um, standard legal tactics. And the other piece that I just wanted to say is that I think, I think something that I've been uh, uh, talking a lot with the groups that I work at with is, you know, looking at the importance of creating a global movement because slavery and Jim Crow in the U.S. functionally operates in the same way as uh, colonialism operated in, uh, in other places. So, you know, the project that we're uh, undergoing in the U.S. is also a project of decolonization, just like it is in these other places. And so that's a natural point of solidarity because um, slavery and Jim Crow allowed for the consolidation of resources and power in the hands of the dominant class in the same way as colonialism um, allowed that to happen. Okay, great. Uh, yes, up the back, gentlemen. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Adlin. Uh, my question is for Mr. Hawkins. 
Um, so this is with regards to the rolling out of um, local strategies for uh, for the for these larger organizations like the ACLU, like it, like Amnesty International, to deal with these issues. We know that uh, over the past couple of months or over the past couple of years, the role actually hasn't really been that smooth for organizations um, such as uh, such as your your guys. Uh, organizations. Um, there have been conflicts between organizers, uh, both officially affiliated with Black Lives Matter and also um, those general, more generally in the movement. For example, uh, Janetta Elzey, who worked for Amnesty International as a field, or as a field organizer in Ferguson, um, has stated that uh, she felt that um, Amnesty sort of, Amnesty sort of took on like a parachuting sort of um, appropriative role to work that was already going on, that work has been, that has been going on in those communities for decades. Um, and I guess my question more broadly, uh, other than the specific question for Mr. Hawkins about that, about that specific relationship and incident, my question more broadly is how and through what specific mechanics can organizations like yours um, when they come into these communities for the first time, work with, learn from, and uplift the voices that, have, that are already there and have already been there for decades. Okay, thanks. Steve? Well, sure. The, I mean, any, anytime any large organization is on the ground, you have to be respectful and enter with a certain level of humility. Um, you know, I'm, I'm certainly no stranger to St. Louis and, uh, in fact, uh, one of my worst experiences ever as an attorney was probably 20 years ago with a client beaten up by the St. Louis Police Department. So I'm, I'm, I'm quite familiar with, with uh, St. Louis. Uh, but yes, I mean, any, any, uh, any time you, you enter the ground, you have to be thinking about how you, um, how, how you approach. What I'm most interested in is how an organization like Amnesty, and Janetta worked wi with us for a year, as well as another um, young person from the community. Um, how, how can an organization like Amnesty absorb and bring in individuals that are quite different from who has normally been on staff? And I, and I, and I think that gets to one of the points I was making about how the human rights community becomes very um, isolated, you know, it was, I mean, so on my staff, I've had so many people, you know, with degrees from, from the Ivy Leagues and, you know, with masters in international affairs or law degrees or what have you, but having, you know, a, a young person who hasn't finished high, uh, college yet, still, still learning their, uh, their way, giving them an opportunity, that, that, that is certainly uh, the kind of challenge that I want for, for, for Amnesty as I sort of redefine uh, how I see, see the role of, of Amnesty, but know that there are lessons to, to be learned in, uh, in uh, doing so. Okay, great. Um, yes, in the back there. Uh, yeah, lady with the delightfully colored um, top. Exactly. This is why I wear that sweater. <laughs> um, thank you so much for all of your words. My name is Shalini Evans, and I work for Urgent Action Fund for Women's Human Rights Defenders, and we provide small grants to human rights defenders all over the world. And my question is probably for everyone except for Gay on the panel, and that is because I'm asking. <laughs> my question is around resourcing the movement. And what we find, particularly here in the U.S., and I'm finding this conversation about using the HR framework within the U.S. interesting because how do you present that and how are you, what is the experience that those of you who run organizations are finding in the philanthropic field in terms of how is philanthropy receiving using a HR framework within the U.S.? Because our experience as an activist fund is that most of our funders who fund internationally outside the U.S. borders are talking about human rights, but within the U.S. borders, when we're bringing in this framework as how we're resourcing and supporting the activists here, are not really receiving it in the same way. So I'd be curious to hear your experience. Thank you. 
I'd love to know why the discrimination against poor old gay. <laughs> why can't she answer the uh, I don't know. You know, I, I was just rolled off the board of the Global Fund for Women. So ah. <laughs> does okay. it make me more That's qualified or less? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> so funding, uh, is it a problem? Would funders not be uh, sympathetic to an international dimension? Let me ask, a answer the question um, from the organizational perspective and to maybe throw it to my colleagues to talk about the first part of the question, which is uh, resources in the movement. From an organizational perspective, um, there are two types of funders. They're, they're the folks that really are in the domestic phase, the domestic field, and there's people that they're in the international field. And if you think that we were struggling with how to connect those things in terms of our work, that's nothing compared to the philanthropic community. Um, that's number one. Number two is um, the organizations, and I actually want to also address, if I can, just the, the question that the, the brother rep, uh, brought up about being on the ground. Organizations, particularly legal organizations, and particularly ones like mine that have national and international focus, have a particular challenge um, in the doing of the work. One of the advantages is that we can see the work from both a national perspective and an international perspective, and we can begin to mobilize ourselves, our, realize, our, our resources and our networks, to try to, um, to bring some stuff to the, to the problem. The challenge is, is that as national and international organizations, we don't have a local lens. And so we have to, all of us have to come with a certain amount of humility and, and openness. But that creates an additional challenge because we're not there just to make friends and to have tea. We're there to actually, to try to create some value add. And very often what happens is that we will make, we will try to make value add from our organizational framework. What we think is the best thing that we can do having heard from the people on the ground about what they need. Um, it brings me to the, to the funding question. I have found that th in, f in places, flashpoints like Ferguson where it, and, and the Black Lives Matter, where the movement is dynamic, where it is inventing and understanding itself at the same time that it's articulating to the world what it is, that is a dy dynamic process that organizations should not mess with, but organizations have to struggle just like the rest of us do to figure out how to do it. So our response was, um, and a, a number of people here on, on stage, uh, Mina being one of them, um, created uh, the Ferguson Legal Defense Network where our role was to ask the organizers what they needed and to try to provide, to bring in legal resources um, to be able to help with things like arrests, tear gas, and different things like that in an international human rights strategy. Um, Jill Humphreys is in the room and w th the same thing happened in Baltimore. Now the reason why that's important to your question is that there is in that flashpoint moment where you have to make the decision about not only how we're gonna be on the ground, but whether we're gonna be on the ground and what we're gonna do, there is no funding support for that, A. B, if you had to think about where should the funding go in that moment, um, all that I would say, and I think you know Steve would agree with me, although don't tell our board members about that, even though one of my board members is in the room, that the resources should flow to movement. And the embedded problem there is that uh, funders want measurables and outcomes, and there is no such thing as a measurable and outcome in a movement turn up. There are strategies and there are goals, and our job are to support the movement strategies and goals. The foundations uh, and, and funders' role is to support the people making the strategies and the people supporting the strategies, but that happens instantaneously, um, and it's very hard to get uh, funders to, to roll with the direction of things going without really being assured that it's going to be successful. And that's, what the, that's the challenge with, the with legal technicians as well. Because if you think about your conversations that you have, people will say, well, I think we should do this. Well, how do you know it's going to work? Well, you don't know that it's going to work. But you know that you're going to try it because it seems like it's the best thing that, that we can do. So that's sort of the, the, the phase that we're in. But I, I'd be really interested in hearing um, about how movement um, should be funded. Because I get the sense it's not adequately funded either. I just love that Vince just said movement turn up. So <laughs> I think you, you, you hit it. Um, there's two things I just want to lift up that Vince just said. One is, and it's not just philanthropy, although philanthropy is important because resources are necessary, around like measurable outcomes that are worth giving money to is, is, is part of the problem, right? And I think that needs to be challenged. Um, and uh, 
and I, I lost my second point, but I, I just want to, I think that's important. And it is hard, right? It's also hard funding black-led organizing has been incredibly hard. Um, and so we've had to approach it in a number of different w ways uh, that tap really into our organizing skills, <coughs> as well as uh, challenging, again, not just philanth uh, philanthropy, but challenging people, period. In this particular moment, I often say there's two choices. You either disrupt status quo or you help maintain it. And wherever you are and whatever you do in the world, and particularly in this country, you, you're doing one or the other. And so it's been sort of, imp it's, it's, it's important for each organizer doing this work, whether it's black-led organizing or it's folks that are talking about human rights in a way where it's, that's the measurable outcome that you're looking for, like that particular policy or bill that you want passed, that's easy to get passed, is actually not what we want. That's not the visionary demand that speaks to the suffering of our people. We want to talk about demands that speak to the suffering of our people that you can't measure in the course of 18 months. Right, that's not a bill that's going to get passed. Um, that's not right, and so, uh, you, so you know, so it's challenging that, right? And then it's going back. Now I remember to what Vince just said. It's investing in a moment and in a people driven um, by a visionary idea that the rights of all people, right, are uh, are what needs to happen and needs to be respected and protected. And that that's what needs to be invested into. And we don't know what's going to work or what's not going to work, but investing in movements and in people that are determined to mobilize around that idea, to organize around that idea is essential. And, uh, and it, that takes a, a level of innovation and experimentation, which is very scary, like in, 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 in philanthropic spaces. But it's scary in all spaces, right? And so that discomfort that we're used to avoiding, because we all want to be comfortable, we have to challenge that, right? Discomfort is essential to change. If we're, not, if we're not uncomfortable, nothing changes. And so that's something that needs to be told not just to folks in, in, in into ph uh, ph philanthropy or funding, but to media people, to nonprofit people, to policy people. Uh, I wasn't going to speak, but um, but then I got inspired here. So, so um, Community Justice Project is a new organization we just launched uh, in July, and uh, and so I wasn't going to speak because we're still fairly early in our journey. But I think that what's interesting for us is that we are finding it we are finding it to be uh, very challenging to um, to first of all explain what it is that we do to funders, and then to have them want to fund us. Um, so. I think the fr the and, and it really is intimately tied to this question about measurable outcomes and to the to this question about black led organizing because the vast majority of the uh, organizations that we work with are um, black led organizations and um, our measurable is uh, for us our measure of our effectiveness is um, whether we were able to build the power of the movements they lead. And when you talk about building power, how do you measure that? And I think, I think, f you know, when you say that to a funder, I think they, um, it, you know, it, it, they, they're like, well, but what are the metrics? And you know, how, how do you know whether whether you're progressing after a year and all of that? And I think um, we're, we're, you know, that's it's an evolving discussion that we're having. And I, I think, I think part of the problem that we're coming up against, particularly in Miami, is that. The kind of radical organizing that the groups that we work with are doing, um, even the local the local funders, they don't want to touch it. No, people don't. Uh, they 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 want to see services. They want to see policy change. They want to see this incremental stuff. But then the moment you start to talk about actually, you know, shifting relations of power, it becomes a lot more difficult to have that work resourced. And so. I mean, it's 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 an ongoing challenge for us, and and I think particularly um, if if you are lawyers that want to situate yourselves uh, alongside radical movements, I think it could it will likely be a a, a challenge for you all as well. But hopefully, we'll have uh, we'll have uh, debunked it a little bit, or not debunked it, but what's the word? Um, figured it out. Um, Nikki, should we finish up? Is that yeah, I was just going to say maybe we can take the last two or max three questions all at the same time because we did okay. start a little late, but we're running low on time. Okay. Uh, so, gentleman here, uh, lady in the back of the room, and someone on the left over there, yeah. So, I'm, uh, <coughs> I'm living in Harlem, and I go to Columbia 
Um, it's two dynamics that I live with that uh you're still welcome in our neighborhood despite yeah, that yeah, I know. <laughs> um i know i'm like in enemy territory here but um so a lot of the people that are in my cohort um are doing work internationally with the united nations doing different internships all over the place and they're focusing their efforts in places that are not harlem as they live in harlem and so that's a big problem that i see i mean it's great that they're doing international work but in the conversations that i have with people individually the problems of black Americans are not taken legitimately as are problems like refugees in Rwanda or Kosovo or any of these places that we hear about in international scope. So those problems are taken legitimately by people here. So I'm wondering what kind of noise we make in America as six witnesses to what happens internationally. Maybe you can answer what kind of noise that we make here, what kind of noise Ferguson makes, what kind of noise New York makes. Um, in different cities in the United States. What noise is heard internationally? And I feel as though if black voices were heard in the United States and taken legitimately by our people as they are internationally, the stories would become legitimate and then people would listen to the stories and then that those stories are then something that you can measure. Okay. So I guess my question is what kind of noise is heard internationally? Okay, thanks. Uh, lady at the back? Yeah. Uh, she's coming Hi. forward. <laughs> Hi, um, my name is Amiya. I'm a volunteer for Rise Up October. Which side are you on? Stop Police Terror, which is a national march um, in New York City, October 22nd through the 24th. And so I wanted to pose uh, two brief questions. One is I'm firmly convinced that you actually can't achieve any rights um, under the current system of exploitation and oppression. You know, it's a capitalist, imperialist system. That's why we don't have the right to eat. We don't have the right to housing. All the things that I think people have been speaking to on the panel. That's why we need a revolution, nothing less. So that's one part of it. The other part of it, which I think is, is relevant to what we're speaking of, is there's never been any, you know, and I'll put that in quotes, any rights that have been given to people without mass resistance. That's what October 22nd through the 24th is about, to put before society, stop police terror, which side are you on? But I think even given the, the title of the, of, the, of the presentation itself, um, the Black Lives Matter movement, you know, this has put this question before the genocide that is happening to, in this country of white supremacy and, and all the rights that are being allowed to continue to happen. And that needs to stop and whole sections of people who want to stop that got to be part of this. So, um, so those are the two part questions I have. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, yes, gentleman over there. Um, you can either speak loudly or wait for the microphone to wait. I'm coming, I'm coming, to sorry. Arrive. Actually, Nikki needs some exercise, so just wait. <laughs> Um, I'm Ted Promer. I teach at Columbia University, and I'm from St. Louis, and know my way a bit around Ferguson. Um, I guess my question is really to sort of maybe think more not about the, the larger questions, but about the, the you know the the baseline question, which is, um, I mean, how do you change police practices in Ferguson and and in Baltimore, for example? And I, in a slightly stylized way, I would say that, that they're sort of at the opposite ends of the spectrum. I mean, Ferguson is such a small place, you could throw the whole police force out and bring other folks in, and perhaps that would make a difference. In Baltimore, you have deeply ingrained racist practices, which seem to resist the fact that you have a black mayor and you know, a black police chief. So I guess I'm wondering, if you're thinking about the kinds of network building strategies, and I was very impressed with the, the emphasis and the focus upon that, how do you sort of uh, make those tactics work in both of those kinds of cases, a kind of a small decentralized place like Ferguson, and something very deep like you know, entrenched racist practices in, in Baltimore or Philadelphia or, or whatever major urban police force you want to take. Could I just abuse the role of um, Donahue over here and just have the final question come from a woman who raised her hand in the back? Um, thanks. As long as it's not your cousin, Nikki. <laughs> 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 who knows, maybe we're related. Thank you very much. Actually, it's not a question, it's more a comment. Uh, my name is Kelly Onimba. I work for the United Nations, actually, for the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. So I'm very pleased to see this uh, event organized by the Black Lives uh, Matter movement. Um, 
I am the focal point on discrimination issues here in uh, the New York office. So it's good to see uh, that Gay McDougall is here. I was working in Geneva with a special procedure branch, so <laughs> it's good to see you again. And also Philip Halston, who was a former special rapporteur. Uh, so it's, it's very good to, to see you here. Just to say that um, I think the young guy there made a comment to say, uh, asking, do, um, do you see any impact of what you are doing here on the ground at the international level, more or less? Uh, I just want to bring to your attention that the United Nations uh, has adopted what we call the Decade for People of African Descent. So it's a program that really focuses on racism, racial discrimination, xenophobia, and intolerance against these people. So it's important for us uh, to make sure that people here in New York are aware of this, pro of this program, of this decade. There will be a number of, of activities organized during 10 years, and we are already working with some NGOs, with universities. So please um, come to our office. It's a United Nations. It's your United Nations. You have a right to come there. And uh, we are open to work with NGOs, with civil society. And we already have an, an event organized on 3rd November uh, with uh, some celebrities. And we are going to talk about racism and racial discrimination in the US, but not only and worldwide. So just to bring this to your okay. attention, I thank you very much. Good. Thank you. Uh, so those questions, I think, give an opportunity for final brief remarks. Um, lead off. Gay, do you want to jump well, in? Well, uh, let me say to the gentleman here that the it's being heard uh, in the international. Yes, 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 yes. The problem, the what's going on here is being heard in the international community and by other governments and by movements, progressive movements around the world, as we've just uh, uh, commented. Uh, this week, the U.S. is having to respond to a, a, a collection of 343 uh, critiques and recommendations for changed action coming from other governments through the U.N. against the U.S. government. It's being heard. So, you know, the question is, you know, what's the next uh, step? But it, 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 it is definitely being heard. The other thing I would say to the gentleman over on my left here um, is um, I know you've, heard, you've read the uh, Justice uh, Department's report uh, on uh, the, the, the situation in Ferguson, but it's really about broad, more broadly. The, I think one of the things that we haven't gotten to talk about tonight uh, fully enough is, you know, we can, we can roll out, you know, uh, recommendations, hundreds of recommendations about how you control police, you know, technical aspects, body cams, you know, report backs, whatever. All of that, we know how to do that. The problem is we don't know how to cre or recreate uh, the uh, the attitudes in this country against African Americans who are poor, and we don't know how to move these communities out of poverty when the attitudes against them are so ingrained in our culture and in the patterns of wealth accumulation in this country. That, that's the, the, the problem is not body cams. It's that. <laughs> Great, thanks. Uh, I couldn't agree more, of course. Um, <laughs> Steve? So, I, so there are some, some things that, that, that can be done. I mean, there, there are certainly international standards that should be in place. Uh, you know, just we did like a 50-state analysis just looking at at uh, which states had some codified law with respect to um, police use of lethal force. States like Maryland, Virginia, Delaware had nothing on the books at all. So actually we're working right now with the Maryland legislature to put uh, forth in Maryland what would be uh, a codified law that, that met international standards. So, you know, for, for example, we just take for granted that if someone has escaped from prison, you know, uh, an escapee, the, 
person can be shot on site, and that it's against any I I international standards. But it's but it's you know, the, the, the case in upstate New, New York was what, what, what was an example of of uh, of that sort of behavior. So uh, the other thing that that's always struck me is you know we have eighteen thousand atomized police force yeah. jurisdictions around uh, the country. Uh, you know, maybe you've run into this, Philip, in your work, but that's not like the Russian Federation or Germany or, or Nigeria, for, for, for that matter. Every, you know, other countries, it's either nationalized as a place like France, you know, or, or it's provincial, as, as, as is often the case. So I think there's something there that's tied to Southern justice that's sort of at the root, I suspect, of why we have these 18,000 localized police for forces. But we face a national crisis that the world is, has, has heard around the, the world. And if black lives truly matter, you know, where, 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 where can be the push to change that? You know, uh, you know, the last time I was in the White House on these issues, you know, the people, the, the people who could make a difference in terms of trying to get, you know, the basic data that's needed for, you know, just for basic accountability are saying, well, you know, we can't even get decent data on lesser crimes out of New Orleans or something like that. But, you know, look, after 9-11, after we had thousands of small security forces in airline, in, in airports around the country. Large airports like Los Angeles, but little small re re regional. And within a matter of a year, <laughs> that was nationalized. TSA was created. There, 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 there was accountability to standards. Mm -hmm. So I call the question as to whether we must move towards a point where we have a more of a nationalized police department with, with higher professional standards. Um, be because if we're in truly a moment of crisis, what is the national response? Yeah, I think that's great. Um. Um, you know, there's been a lot of work around the country uh, to um, to challenge policing practices um, that has helped, you know, that has helped save lives. I think what we need to do, in addition to that, a challenge is um, to acknowledge where uh, police, how policing was born in this country and the legacy of policing. Um, and and how that legacy manifests today, and how policing is used as a means of social control, particularly for black bodies, for poor people. And so in addition to acknowledging the legacy and the history of policing in this country, I think we also need to acknowledge that policing practices as we know it is a, is a fundamental problem, and that we need to see not just like a drastic, uh, drastic change, but Policing as we know it needs to radically change. In fact, I dare I say to use the word, to need to be abolished, right? Um, because unless we do that, we will continue to see black people, poor people, people of color, continuously be tar being targeted, right? Um, killed. Um, we'll continue to see young people on the streets of St. Louis, New York City, Chicago, everywhere, right? And so there's, there's this radical challenge to again acknowledge the history of policing and to also acknowledge uh, the ways in which policing is used as a means of social control. Um, I wanted to go back to another question that, that you had asked and then I'll be, I'll be very brief. Um, people around the world are talking about what's happening in the US. That is because of the uprising that happened in Ferguson. That's because of the courage and the bravery that, that happened on the streets of Ferguson, on the streets of Baltimore, and across the country. I think what we see is, um, as we see sort of an awakening in this country of people sort of choosing disruption, sh whether they're shutting it down, going online, as a means to talk about their truths and, uh, and, and share with the world their resistance, we see sort of the world responding in a way. But it's important to acknowledge that that, is, that that comes from the people, right? As it always has. Now people that, that, and, and I, that go and focus on human rights abroad and not necessarily here, um, I think uh, do it for a number of reasons. Um, and I think that we need to ask why, right? 
Why is it that someone will focus on what's happening in a different, in another part of the world and ignore what's happening at home? And I think what we might find is an inability to challenge racism, an inability to challenge capitalism, an inability to challenge white supremacy, heteropatriarchy, all of those things. Um, it's really important, I think, um, as we do work abroad, which, which I've done and I think is essential, that we also challenge what's happening at home and that we see that both are directly connected. Great. Uh, Mina? I'd love you to drop the mic, but then I didn't want to <laughs> ruin NYU's nice equipment. So um, uh, I, I agree with what, what uh, Tanjiwe was saying, and I think, I think um, the, the two things that I will say is um, I agree that it's it's on as American advocates. I think it is our imperative to um, project at the international level um, a uh, to challenge the 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 re the record or the um, the image that the U.S. tries to put out there that it is that it has a perfect human rights record. Um, it's it, you know I'm always astounded when I go abroad and I talk to people about the fact that I'm that I'm. Um, talking about human rights abuses in the US, in Geneva, people are always surprised. And so it really uh, shows like the extent to which the US has really um, you know, reinforced and, um, and really uh, allowed that the, the idea that things are you know, chocolate and roses in the US all the time you know, around the world. And, uh, and so I, I think it's really important both for our movement here, but then also to challenge le American exceptionalism that, that, we, um, that we use those forums as places to, to really expose what's happening here at home. And the second thing that I, will, that I wanted to say is that is, you know, as a movement lawyer, um, is, is to, to be close to the people. So, um, you know, Tenjiwe hears me say this all the time, like I look at human rights as, um, you know, the sort of legal definition of human rights as it's elaborated in treaties and laws and all that, standards, um, and, and then, you know, the grassroots interpretation of it. And, uh, and my, my feeling is that our job as advocates is to um, use the transformative demands and the transformative vision um, that comes from the people in, in the, uh, trying to create the society that they want to see that respects um, uh, the human dignity of all people, and to to use these legal frameworks as ways that um, to to strengthen the this grassroots interpretation. So not so not confine um, the demands to uh, what what rights appear in certain treaties, but to rather use spaces in which um, in which you know uh, accountability. Um, we're we're, uh, we're trying to hold our governments accountable to uh, to also give life to the demands that are coming straight from the ground. Great, thanks, Vince. Um, so I I want to sort of address two questions. Um, one, I want to speak to the to the sister over there. I I very much agree with your second point, which is that mass action is the way that um, change happens. Touching uh, on what Tenjewe said, that uh, the, the idea of mass action and disruption really does make people uncomfortable, and out of that discomfort does come change, and that's really deeply important. I disagree with the first uh, part because I do think rights do play a very important role. They're not the end game, and sometimes in the legal field we think about it as the end game, but it really is a mechanism to hold <coughs> government accountable, to uh, that rights will properly applied, will cause government to do the right things and stop the government from doing the wrong things. And there are so many examples of when that doesn't happen, it makes us think maybe rights aren't the way to focus. But I wanted to sort of tie that to, and I'm just gonna stand up because I can't see you back here. Um, I wanted to tie that to the question about police accountability. Um, and I, I, with respect, I, I think it's, it's not as useful to talk about what are the strategies to reform Ferguson police versus Baltimore because in some ways we can, as lawyers, come up with a thousand differences um, and to be able to segment it that way. Um, but I think the fundamental problem is the same. And so really the, and why I think human rights is important is that in order to change anything, any system, any process, is that you have to change three things simultaneously. And one is the structures. Two, the second thing that you have to change are the behaviors, and the third thing that you have to change are the beliefs. And that the law as a tool um, can actually be instrumental in changing all three, but we make the mistake sometimes in thinking that those three things are not separate and different. So just to give a, a quick example, um, President Obama came in after George Bush, and President Obama did change some 
structures with respect to national security. But if you look at the behaviors that came out of the Obama administration with respect to drones and immigration, just two examples, um, more drones than ever before, more deportations than any, ever before. So just focusing on the structural piece that Obama good, Bush bad, doesn't actually get you where you need to be. If you, if you would imagine whether Donald Trump became president, for example, what we might see is an entirely different structural regime. So we're not really so much focusing on behavior. We're talking about the structures. This cat wants to like, you know, kick people out of the country for you know being brown. Um, so the, how that relates to to the to the question about policing is is in the following way: um, the policing problem is not a policy problem. It's a structural racism problem, which is an essentially a political problem, in my view. And the challenge that we have as lawyers is to think about the political problem. Meaning, how does the police chief and the mayor support what the police are doing? How do we deal with that problem through litigation? Um, the belief problem is largely, and I've been thinking about this a lot, policing, the greatest impediment to police reform is the police union. Because if you think about, the police unions are like the Dick Cheney of policing. It's like every time you make a little bit of, uh, every time something moves forward, they pop up and say, cops are getting killed, uh, black people are dangerous, it's either you or them, and it shifts the whole paradigm. So part of that strategy is, and I think that one of the differences, is that it is easier to think about political and legal strategies with respect to leadership and unions in Ferguson than it is in Baltimore. Um, but at the same time, that they're really, I think, part of the fundament, fundamentally part of the same problem, and it's just really a question of scale and what are people telling you on the ground, which is where you understand the, po the politics of it. Great. Thanks, uh, Vince. I want to. I think that probably says it all. Um, I think the one thing that we're not lacking for at the end of tonight is an ambitious agenda. Uh, Tenji Wei's words that you're either supporting the status quo or you're trying to disrupt it, I think will ring in our ears. Uh, and there's no shortage of really specific challenges to us if we want to actually make sure that black lives do matter. So many thanks to you all for coming tonight and to Nikki. Okay.